I think it's a great name. All right. Thanks. I love it. I like anything that starts with the letter J for some reason. Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. My guest today was introduced to me by Sharon McRae. I heard him give a talk to her group, and I was really fascinated with what he was going to talk about. It has to do with health span and phytonutrients. His name is Dr. Jed Vahey, and please welcome him to the show. I wore a very special shirt for you and very special earrings because I heard somebody say that you are the world's leading expert on cruciferous vegetables. Thank you for being so attentive to my uh, to my pre prejudices, and I love the shirt. I, I I would wear it if you sent me one. I wouldn't wear the earrings, but well, um, well, you know, I, I you know, honestly, every guest on the show that lives in the United States, the first time they're on, they get two bottles of vinegar as their gift. Maybe I could uh, send you this instead because I really do love. I, you know, it's funny, Doctor Fahey, because I you, you might not know my whole story, but I've been vegan for forty four years. But the first twenty six, I was a very unhealthy vegan. But the one vegetable. I always liked was broccoli. I don't know why. And I still love it. I, I love broccoli. Well, there, there are bitter, you know, there's a bitter principle in broccoli, obviously. And there are, there are preferences, you know, some people love it, some people hate it, but um, anyway, um, I, I happen to love it too, but I, I don't think that's why I, in fact, I'm sure that's what, not why I got involved with it. I got involved with it uh, a long time ago in a, in a project before I even came to, went to Johns Hopkins, uh, which is the research that I'll tell you about. But um, anyway, thank, thanks for having me on. And um, I look forward to sharing, you know, with this kind of an audience, a non-scientific um, peer audience, um, scientific peer audiences can be brutal. And yes, you, your blood pressure sometimes gets up uh, getting ready to answer questions from them because frequently they're hostile. You're, you may have guests with hostile questions too, but I, I love being able to try to impart some of the highly technical stuff that we do or that I've done over, the, over my career to a lay audience or an audience that's interested in food or an audience that just has questions about health. Um, so I'll do my best to answer them. I hope we can get to some audience questions and I'm, I know you have some also. That's great. End. Yeah. Well, a lot of my audience, you know, we do have quite a few medical professionals that watch the show either on the replay or live. And a lot of my audience, they may not be medical professionals, but they're very interested in health. They're, we call them well, lovingly hyper conscientious nutcases is what Dr. Doug Lyle calls them because they're in what he calls the hyper health arena. And this is the kind of thing that is very interesting to my audience. Great, great. Yeah. Well, how did you get interested in it, though? Um, long story short, I, well, it's a long story, but um, let me make it uh, as concise as possible. I, I uh, went to school as an undergraduate. I was originally going to be a classical musician. I messed up my hand and couldn't audition. I was a cellist. I couldn't audition, so I decided to go to college. I went to college and studied algal physiology and phytoplankton and, and thought I'd feed the world with uh, you know, oysters and mussels, filter feeders, uh, microalgae. Um, when I got out of college, there were no jobs in that, in that area. Um, I went to graduate school and got a degree in algal physiology, the study of microalgae and what they do. And I thought I was going to feed the world with spirulina or spirulina, depending on potato, potato, how you pronounce it. Um, we were sort of early in the spirulina game. Um, and then I got a job and um, there were still no jobs in algae. And there were still uh, the, the dream of feeding the world uh, with algae was still far away uh, from reality. And I think it probably still is. Um, and anyway, ultimately I wound up working with broccoli um, at a large company and I saw an ad for that Paul Talley at Johns Hopkins had placed looking for someone to help. He had, he and his colleague Yushin Zhang had just rediscovered sulforaphane, a phytochemical from broccoli. Um, in, in 1992, they published it and he was looking to expand his research operation um, and focus on broccoli. And so he and I gelled, we clicked. Um, I, uh, I think I probably got the job because I told him I had seen him, uh, when I was a 
an undergraduate seen him give a talk on um, psychoactive drugs um, at Johns Hopkins. And as I told him, I said, you know, you, you, you got me interested in smoking pot for the first time. And this is a very proper uh, professor. And he looked shocked, but I think he was happy that I uh, um, admitted my uh, sins to him right off the bat. Anyway, we, 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 we hit it off very well. And, and, I, have, I um, joined his group and we worked uh, for a qu- over a quarter of a century on primarily the phytochemicals in broccoli um, and related cruciferous vegetables and Moringa, which is also closely related. And uh, Paul passed away, unfortunately, a couple of years ago. He was in his mid nineties, um, but was working up till the very end. Uh, and um, I retired a year, a year ago from Hopkins and decided it was actually, it was becoming more fun to try to share stories about better health and phytochemicals and eating plant forward diets with uh, people who, with, with the lay public, with people like my, you know, my family who aren't scientists, um, friends, na- friends and neighbors who aren't scientists. So, right. Anyway. In, in, I mean, I think most of the audience would know, but just maybe explain what a phytochemical or phytonutrient is, because phyto means plant and nutrient yep. means nutrient. I'd, I'd love to. And I have actually, um, I have some slides, which I could share with you that sort of sort of go through that. One of the first slides talks about that. About would that would be great. Would you like me to blast I love, them up there? I, I love slides because it makes me feel like I'm in school. Well, I used slides for a hundred years teaching and I'm tired of them, but they, they do have this, <laughs> they do serve a function and they, they're a good reminder to those of us who are talking about what we want to talk about. So let me ask you, is, is the screen share working? Perfectly. Perfectly. Okay. Um, so that's who I am. I have consulted for food and supplement companies since um, retiring from Hopkins uh, a year, year or so ago. Um, You asked about phytochemicals. First, let me define a word um, that called a word, the word health span. Um, So there's there's overwhelming evidence from the epidemiologic literature for the past 30, 40 years. Everybody knows what an epidemiologist is after the past uh, 19 months of COVID. Um, So epidemiologists looked at the evidence on fruit and vegetable consumption. And the evidence is clearly that it reduces risk from a variety of chronic diseases and improves health span. I and others, many others now define health span as the enjoyment of good health or aging with minimal handicap and near full function for the duration of a vigorous and productive natural life. That's a lot of words. What does that mean? Well, in my mind, I like to, to, uh, presented in cartoon form as the following plot years of life. You can take it out to a hundred years or 120 years. I think maximum lifespan of humans is 118. We're not looking at extending lifespan. That is uh, a field that some people are very passionate about, but that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about plotting, uh, life versus quality of life. And so the x-axis, the left-hand side, if you will, is quality of life. And as we know, most of us are, were born, especially in the West, we're born to good health. If, if we're lucky, if we survive childbirth in the first few uh, years, our quali- let's set our quality of life at some arbitrary 100%. But unfortunately, over the years, it goes downhill, quality of life goes downhill. And we frequently have in this part of the curve, a bunch of concurrent chronic illnesses. And we become fodder for gerontologists by the time we get into our 50s or 60s or 70s. And uh, for interventions and for pharmaceutical interventions. Um, So to get to the concept of phytochemicals now, um, there are plenty of people, and I'm sure uh, uh, I'm sure Chef AJ that you've talked about the blue zones on your on your show. I, I haven't seen that one, but 
Um, there are plenty of people who live long lives and who have a prevention oriented lifestyle and who don't get all of these chronic diseases. And then one day you just don't wake up. And honestly, that's the way I'd like to go out um, to be pretty damn healthy until one day I'm not, and I just don't wake up. <laughs> so, and that many, many, many of us fervently believe that phytochemicals and a plant, at least a plant forward or a plant centric or a plant based diet is key to that. And that means starting a plant based diet and healthy lifestyles. I'm not I'm not ignoring other healthy lifestyles, which we could spend hours on. But that involves starting those habits, those lifestyles as early as possible. Um, and uh, you know, the other way to, I mean, you could, I'd like to actually work with someone to try to quantify that, quantify this. So the area under the curve is sort of the metric of health span, but bottom line is push out healthy lifespan, high quality of life, the blue curve, um, and do it with a preventive lifestyle. Um, so that's, um, and, and I use the word phytochemicals and to, get back, you can't ask an ex-professor to answer a question quickly. Um, so you asked, asked about the word phytochemicals. Phytochemicals are also known as phytonutrients, and I'm sort of morphing towards using that term because a lot of people, a lot of lay public um, non-scientists hear the word chemicals and immediately there's a turnoff um, and they don't want to hear any more. I think phytonutrients, which is Oh, I misspelled that too, um, but, which is a term that, uh, yeah, it's P-H-Y-T-O, a term that many, um, many people in the scientific literature have used, and I've sort of shunned it for a while, but I'm, I'm sort of coming around. I think it may be a better, more public-friendly term, but phytochemicals are all those things that make plants look, smell, and taste the way they do. So they're not the, um, I think I have a slide here, yeah. They're the non-nutritive compounds or agents or chemicals, call them what you will, that aren't required for survival of either the plant or the human being, but that convert, confer health benefits to people. They're present in plants at very low levels, low molecular weight, just meaning they're small molecules. They're not big honking things like starch or, or DNA. Um, and they're the, the the key is they're not the proteins, carbohydrates, fats, and fiber that are the, the um, you know, that dietitians and nutritionists talk about all the time. Um, they're things that plants produce to give them advantages in their environment, whether it be getting poll attracting pollinators, warding off pests, warding off insects or fungi that are going to chow down on them. Um, and uh, as I say, they include a lot of, all of really the colors, <clears throat> pigments, scents, and a variety of compounds that have, <clears throat> excuse me, antibiotic and other defensive activities um, for the plant. So, and we are able to co-opt many of them. Yes, some, some chemicals in plants are toxins, but many of them are beneficial to us. Um, my colleague, Tom Kensler and I did an opinion piece uh, a few months ago in a, a journal called Food Frontiers. It's open access. And by the way, I can share either directly with Chef AJ or um, with listeners, any of the links to papers that I show. And my personal website now, which is jedfahey.com, has hot links to all of the papers that we've published. So in this paper, we used a very conservative estimate that we stole from, uh, from another recent paper, a bunch of experts on phytochemicals. And they estimated that there are as many as 50,000 phytochemicals. Many others around the world and around the, the science of phytochemicals put that number as much, much higher, like an order of magnitude or two higher, as high as many millions of compounds, all different compounds. And this, this group, Barbasi and, and colleagues um, have, I think that, I don't know if they coined this, but they've called phytochemicals the dark matter of nutrition, which is a term that I love. And um, 
why is it the dark matter? Because these compounds are invisible to a lot of epidemiologic studies and to most of the public. And as they say, they represent the, the unmapped chemical complexity of our diet, which is really cool when you think about it. We think we know so much about diet and about plants and, and, and vegetables and fruit. We know a lot about their carbs and their proteins and their fats and their simple sugars. And we know a lot about their DNA, but we are only just beginning to get a grasp of the, the complexity and the interactions of these phytochemicals and how they interact with other stuff in the plants. Um, and so we said in our opinion piece, uh, Tom Kensler and I, that you know part of that problem we think is because there's so many of these bloody chemicals that it's been difficult for the research community by and large to focus on, on particular phytochemicals. And then it's, it was and still is very difficult to look at multiple phytochemicals together in our food matrix and see how they affect health. And I, I distinguish that from take a single phytochemical, purify it, put it in a pill. It's called a dietary supplement. Um, but so there's a tremendous amount to be learned, but I, I think um, first we have to realize what part of the problem is. And part of the problem is there are so many of these compounds that um, it is difficult and will be difficult to get a handle on them. And funding agencies um, have to prioritize things a bit better than they've done so far, I think, so that we can get at the important ones, the important interactions, the important components of, of the foods that most people eat. Um, this might be, well... I'll, I'll, I'll go on for a couple of, couple more slides if you'd like, but please interrupt because um, I'm savvy of the fact that uh, one can get bored listening to someone lecture like this. Um, so just a couple of other uh, things about phytochemicals in general. In this paper that we published a few months ago, we looked in the scientific literature and looked at the number of citations for it that sort of the top 40 list of phytochemicals from, again, these are all compounds from plants present at low levels. They do things for plants. And so you can see, you know, 30, 40,000 peer reviewed public publications for some of these compounds like quercetin and saponins and curcumin and beta, beta carotene. You're familiar with some of the names probably, but probably not others. So you then, sorry, take that graph and flip it on its side. And the number of citations, the total number of citations is now on the X axis. And I've plotted that, we've plotted that against number of clinical trials registered with the, the, the governmental clinical trial site. It's called clinicaltrials.gov. And it's quite interesting. So not surprisingly, CBD and N-acetylcysteine uh, by far top the list in terms of the number of clinical trials that have been done. So this is taking it away from the test tube and the, 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 you know, the, the, the rat or the mouse model in a lab and putting it, giving it to people in, in, in clinical trials. And then, you know, we, we can look at the data, we can come back to it, but then things like capsaicin, pain relief from pepper, um, curcumin, resveratrol compounds you may or may not have heard of. Um, but so these phytochemicals are being looked at, um, but it's sort of a mess right now still. And we, I think, I think it's fair to say we really could use some focus in this effort or, or some better focus in order to move ahead with some of them. So yeah, let me stop the screen share for a second and, and take a breath and, and you're the host. I should give you a chance to ask questions or yeah, direct no, me. Oh, well, thank directly. you. I, I actually, I really like slides, but I, I do have a few questions. Talk to us about this concept of superfoods, because, you know, I've listened to a lot of the podcasts and, and heard about, you know, some of the supplements that are available, but yep. do they work if, for example, you're eating a McDonald's diet? Yeah, that's, that, you know, that's a great question. And I think it's actually a, a question that that could be put to the test, um, but I'm not aware that it really has been um, the McDonald's diet part of it. Um, 
I used to, I used to not like the term superfoods. In fact, I have a little opinion piece on that from a few years ago. Um, and I didn't like it because um, it implies that, you know, if, if moringa or if broccoli or if, uh, you know, daikon, whatever it is, is called a superfood, it sort of implies that romaine lettuce and spinach and, you know, acorn squash are not superfoods or are not worthy. So I didn't like it from the, based on the sort of implied contrast. And I also didn't like the term because so many people, including a lot of, uh, um, I would call, I guess I would have to call them profiteers, were calling everything a superfood. There was a superfood du jour. And, you know, every day you'd, you'd find something else being called a superfood. Um, I, I think all vegetables and fruit are more or less superfoods. Um, and, and I think it's all about eating a varied diet in moderation. Um, so, but, you know, that said, certainly there are foods, um, there are primary, well, I, I'd say almost exclusively fruits and veg um, that probably have an edge on others in terms of their phytochemical content and what some of those phytochemicals do for your body. So I've never been a fan phytochemically speaking of iceberg lettuce, for example, and I've always dissed it and used it as sort of my, my bottom of the rung comparison. Um, but a lot of people eat a lot of iceberg lettuce. It certainly has fiber. It adds moisture and water to your diet. It's obviously pretty low on chlorophyll and pigments. It doesn't have much of a distinctive odor. Um, so I've actually never done the comparison. And now that I, I've mentioned this a few times in the past year, I should probably go and check iceberg lettuce and see if it really is such a sort of non-superfood. But, you know, there's there's um, there are things that are very dark green. There are things that are very dark yellow, dark red. People talk about eating by by color, you know, eating many colors of the food. That's all because of phytochemicals. And I would hesitate to not call any of them phyto um, superfoods, rather. Um, a, a lot of supplement companies do uh, make extracts of various things that they call superfoods and, you know, enrich the amount of uh, particular phytochemicals uh, from that food. And I'm actually working with a company that I co-founded 20, over 20 years ago that's doing that with a compound from broccoli. So I think there's a place for supplements. And I think you could say, yeah, glucoraphanin or sulforaphane from broccoli are, uh, uh, are, are part of what make broccoli a superfood. Um, and you could also make the case that you like broccoli, I like broccoli, but half the world or 40% or 60% hates it. So they're not going to get their broccoli. And is it bad for them to take supplements uh, containing that are enriched in the phytochemicals of broccoli? I, I don't think so. Um, but, but will they be affected? I guess my question is, will they be, if, if somebody's eating that bad, or, I, I I interview a lot of doctors for these summits. I do one specifically based on GI health. And a lot of the doctors say that if somebody's diet is really that bad, adding something to it isn't really going to improve it. I, I, I tend to vote with those docs. I, I, as I say, I, um, so I, 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 I tend to agree. I haven't seen, uh, you know, sort of large scale population or epidemiologic trials, um, that have addressed that there may be, but what you would have to do there is you'd have to You'd have to parse, uh, you'd have to look at, at uh, qu um, quantiles or, uh, you know, um, you have to look at a large population, get their dietary history. That's been done many, many, many times. Segregate them out by how much cruciferous vegetables, other vegetables, fruit and veg they eat. Get the top bunch and then divide that bunch by um, those who do take supplements and those who don't, or sorry, you'd have to take the bottom bunch, those who have really crappy diets and look at their, their, um, their intake of dietary supplements and see if there's much of a difference in health outcomes. That's a big, nasty study to do, and it will never be perfect. So I just don't know, it may well have been done. Um, 
the sort of the, the 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 intervention I think would be fun to do. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the product Soylent. Um, oh, I, I know the movie Soylent Green. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, some wise guys in Silicon Valley decided this is about eight years ago or ten years ago, maybe decided that they hated taking time away from their screens. Uh, I don't know if they're coders or I, I'm not sure what they did, but they were in the computer industry. I think eating was a bother to them. They wanted to have just something they could chug. So they made this product called soy, which they called Soylent. And we won't repeat for the audience, but Soylent Green with, was it Burt Lancaster, I think, or? Uh, I don't, it was creepy Char though. Charlton Heston was creepy. I think yeah. it was Charlton Heston. It was a very yeah. creepy movie. Yeah. And they weren't eating fruit and vegetables, but um, but anyway, so they named this product Soylent and it was when it started just a gray, it was a bottle of this grayish tannish goop. Um, and all it was, it, if they had gone through, you know, some nutritional encyclopedia and it was the required carbs, protein, um, you know, I think they had soy protein in it, um, and some fats and, and, it was just the basics and, and vitamins, a short list of required uh, essential vitamins. And they looked at amino acid profile and so on, but no phytochemicals. It was all purified stuff put together in a jar. And their thesis was you could drink five jars of this a day for a 2000 calorie diet and live happily ever after and not have to ever mess with broccoli. Um, so the, I know the founder, I don't know the founder, but I know that the founder and, and many others went on a, you know, month long binges, eat, drinking nothing but this Soylent. Um, anyway, they got no phytochemicals. It'd be, it'd be really cool to do an intervention with consenting adults, of course, and have them just drink Soylent for a couple of years, um, plus or minus um, some phytochemical supplements. Um, but I've taken too much time speculating. Um, I'm not going to do that trial, certainly. And I wouldn't recommend anybody adopt that lifestyle. And that doesn't sound very, uh, very satisfying. Just want, you know, a few comments in the chat, like from Nancy says, I find his kind of talk fascinating. Lissa says, please assure you that we're not bored at all. So people, people do, you know, our, our audience is a little bit. They're kind of, they like this kind of stuff. So Jesse says, does Dr. Fahey believe that extracted nutrients are more beneficial than eating the whole plant food? No, no, I, I, I don't. However, um, Jesse, that was, you say? Yeah, Jesse. Yeah. So Jesse, I think, um, you know, as I've gotten older, one of the things that I've realized is that uh, I and many other people do exercise less and require less food, require less calories than I did 20, 30 years ago. So I think with a theoretically uh, healthy person or with, a, let's call me a healthy person, even though I'm not, um, uh, but moderately healthy, as they get older, getting the required, you know, seven servings a day of fruits and vegetables or whatever, choose the American plate or whatever dietary vehicle uh, or guidebook you want to go by um, becomes more difficult. You've got to put down a lot of, a lot of calories to get, um, to get that phyto, that um, fruit and vegetable load. So I think as people get older, it's very reasonable to, uh, to, to take supplements. So that's, that's one. Sound like a politician now. Number one. Um, <laughs> number two, um, I think as an insurance policy, a lot of people just aren't that sure of, you know, the, how well they're doing with a, with a plant forward diet or with, a, with their diet in general. Or some people are going to, going to refuse to um, eat a healthy diet and they're going to pile on the bacon and, and chips and stuff. And, you know, would they profit by, would, would their health benefit by taking phytochemical, phytochemical supplements, phytochemical rich supplements? It might, I think it might. Um, and I guess then the third, number three, number three um, is people with, with, with various medical conditions. Um, there are various medical conditions that call for, um, increased antioxidant um, protection, um, increased immune protection. And one of the things that um, is, 
is abundantly clear is that some of these compounds like glucoraphanin and sulforaphane from broccoli, which we call an indirect antioxidant, um, don't act as a, they don't act directly like oranges or vitamin C, but what they do is they crank up a person's metabolism um, and it's, it's, they crank up a person's detoxifying uh, metabolism so that as oxidative insults, um, whether it's from UV light or whether it's from food we eat or air we breathe, those oxidative insults to the body can be neutralized um, more quickly or more effectively. So I, I'd say, yeah, there are plenty of reasons to take supplements. In theory, um, a you know, 20 to 30 year old buff, perfectly healthy person who doesn't run marathons, but gets plenty of exercise, I'd say probably wouldn't need to take any supplements, but there'll be a ton of people who will argue with that. And that's fine. You know, you asked my opinion, Jesse. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's great. Thank yeah. you. Let's see. Um, I, and I did look it up. It was Charlton Heston and Soylent Green, you know, there we go. There we go. So, so you did mention what phytochemicals were because people actually were asking in the chat that, that might have logged on a little bit late. So why are they not recognized the way, you know, like you hear about vitamins and minerals and, and people take supplements with vitamins and minerals, but people don't, see, they don't seem to be promoted quite as much, you know, like a minimum daily dose, like the way yeah. vitamins and minerals are. So why, why is that? And, and actually what happens if we don't consume phytochemicals, will we be fine? Or are there some ramifications? Well, I, I, I mean, this is a very complex question to answer. And I would definitely refer you to this opinion piece that Tom Kenser and I just did that I referenced because we try to tangle with it a little bit. And it's a, it's a very complex question because and this is in part because of what I showed you, the, 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 the number of um, scientific studies, uh, those two graphs that I showed you, there's so many of them that to build a consensus on any one of them individually really is, is difficult. So the, the cannabis and THC and, and CBD industry, of course, went bananas, has gone bananas recently. So there are a lot of studies on CBD coming out not THC because it's been illegal to do so. But so you can pick out specific phytochemicals and look at them and say, oh, this is why they've gotten so much attention. Um, but you know, there are truly, I mean, an absolute minimum 50,000. I think there are probably 5 million uh, different phytochemicals and they all have subtle differences in structure and function. And you know, when young investigators are sort of sprouting their wings and trying to establish themselves Many times they'll pick a new phytochemical that's for various reasons to try to try to tell a story about it. So this this plot, this map of who's done what with phytochemicals is really it, it's very diffuse and it's all over the place. So it's it's a very difficult question to answer. Um, I am actually consulting for a company called Brightseed Bio out in in um, uh, San Francisco. And they're using um, artificial intelligence and, and machine learning uh, and metabolomics and proteomics to try to understand how, to try to get at what these phytochemicals are and understand how they work in foods and what, what plants have what phytochemicals. Um, but I mean, this is, this is a massive undertaking both for them and, and for research in, in general. Um, so yeah, I think we need phytochemicals. And, and there's a whole, there's a long list, very lengthy list of functions that they have. Um, let me screen share just, just um, for a second again. And, um, oh, sorry, I have to, um, I, I wanna show the person who asked that question, just, just an example. Um, I, was going to, I was going to get to this later um, if you wanted to, but, this is, this is one phytochemical, okay? And this is a phytochemical I've spent the last quarter century working on from broccoli, sulforaphane. And we were trying to map out just some of the pathways and the disease interactions that this, phyto, this single phytochemical um, helped with. And um, remember, it's not a protein, a carbohydrate, 
um, uh, a fat or fiber. It's a phytochemical present in very low levels in broccoli. So there's this major, I, I won't go into details, but I want, I want to wow you with how many different pathways there are. Um, so this is a major antioxidant and cellular or cytoprotection response. Um, it's, it, it's involved in detoxifying AGEs, advanced glycation end products that you find in food um, and in the body. Mitochondrial support, it's anti-inflammatory, it's immune response activating, um, and on and on and on. And antibiotic, potent and selective antibiotic against Helicobacter pylori, which causes stomach cancer and ulcers, and which I've worked with a good bit has antiviral um, uh, capacity. So this then leads to, if you look at the yellow boxes, um, it's being effective uh, as best we can tell. And this is a subject of many clinical trials now and, and, and has been um, in amelioration of symptoms of a variety of conditions. In particular, we've been looking recently at um, neurodegenerative and neurodevelopmental conditions like autism. Um, so there is there. I'm going to stop sharing because I. That's again a deliberately complicated answer to your question. But yeah, I think there, and that's just one phytochemical. And with enough research, we could make similar plots for every phytochemical out there. Some will probably have no connections to diseases we know of. Others will probably have more than this. Um, I hope that answered your question. Well, then I have another one that might be just as difficult to answer. What's an antioxidant? Hmm. Easy. Um, so an antioxidant is, a. Uh, th so there are two kinds of antioxidants. There are direct antioxidants and indirect antioxidants. Um, direct antioxidants, the classical kind that most people have heard about, um, t uh, see, um, uh, oxidative compounds of oxidative stress coming into cells. Um, and, and, and these oxidants are compounds like, like bleach or peroxide that will, that will damage vital cellular um, uh, structure and, and function and, and, uh, and uh, can cause mutation, uh, but more often than not, just screw up the structure and the function of the cell. Um, so ideally you neutralize them. The human body has uh, many innate or endogenous antioxidants. The most abundant one is called glutathione. And this is a tripeptide, it's three amino acids strung together. Um, and it's very abundant and it's present at remark. I mean, I can't quote you. Well, I can quote you the percentage in sort of scientific lingo, but I won't bother. But in the retina of the eye, the macula of the eye, present in very high levels. Why? Because it's needed like all the time when you're getting photo oxidative stress on the eye. It's present in the lungs, all the epithelial tissues. So glutathione, and it's present in the brain, and it's very much involved with protecting the brain against oxidative stress. So you get, you get this oxidative stress, or you get these oxidants from the air you breathe, um, as byproducts of what your cells do, we live um, in an oxygen-rich environment. Our mitochondria have to have oxygen, but they spit out some products that need to be neutralized. So your body's full of this glutathione that cycles. It, 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 to, to try to keep it um, not from getting too technical, um, glutathione gloms onto an oxidizing molecule it changes its conformation. And then you have, you have enzymes in your body that turn glutathione, the, the reduced form back into the, or the oxidized form back into the reduced form. So basically it's like a cycling uh, teeter totter. The oxidant stress messes with glutathione, changes its conformation. You have enzymes that fix it and put it back to the way it was. Vitamin C is an, is an ant potent antioxidant, um, beta carotene, lycopene, a lot of the red pigments you're familiar with, familiar with lutein. Um, and there are plenty, there are many, many of them in the diet. The indirect antioxidants like sulforaphane from broccoli don't do anything 
themselves. They don't detoxify um, oxidants, but what they do is they ramp up or soup up or crank up this enzymatic mechanism in the body that puts glutathione back to its, to its form, which is ready to detoxify. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I'm yeah. I I lose my voice all the time. That's Uh, okay. That's that's okay. So yeah, the, how do you determine how potent an antioxidant is and, and do we need them? Do we need antioxidants and phytochemicals as much as we need vitamins and minerals? Um, I, I guess because there is an absolute requirement for vitamins and minerals, certain of them, um, I, I guess they win, you know, they win. You have to have them. Um, I guess it, well, you have to have them for life. So if we look at, you know, go back to my curve of health span to live, to survive, you've got to have them. So your life will end way before a hundred or whatever is on the bottom axis of that curve. If you don't have them, um, that's not the case with phytochemicals, almost certainly. However, if you want the health span curve, the quality of life curve to get squared off and to stay high so you just don't wake up someday, then I would maintain that you need, you need phytochemicals. Um, you need antioxidants also. What's, what's unknown and what's a really interesting research question that hasn't been adequately answered is, do you need a lot of antioxidants, direct antioxidants from your diet? Or if you're able to crank up your body's defensive antioxidant system, this glutathione system and others, um, might you do just fine? Um, so it's it's a bit unclear how, how much of a load of dietary antioxidants you really need to stay healthy but if, but one, but the thing that I can more or less guarantee you is that if you don't have them, you better damn well count on your body's innate detoxifying system. And if that's flawed, you're not going to, chances are, you're not going to know, uh, uh, at least until, well, chances are it, it's very difficult to know. And I'm not aware that there are really good tests to assess that. Um, there are all sorts of blood tests for inflammatory markers and things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, in, in this world, not very many people can get their blood tested for 500 biomarkers uh, twice a year. Great. I don't know if I answered that question. Thanks. Do we really have to have mustard seed with our broccoli to get the benefit? Or is just eating broccoli good enough? That sort of came out of the blue, but I know why. So, um, it, no, we don't have to. Um, broccoli, uh, let's go back to a screen share. Um, cause you're, uh, let's see, did it screen sharing has stopped. Sorry. Let me share this. Okay. Do you, do you have my screen? There we, there go. we go. Okay. Okay. Um, I just want to find, there we go. Okay. So I've showed this slide many times. Um, There's this reaction in uh, that occurs um, when you eat raw cruciferous vegetables. I've got a radish here as an example. Um, And so there's a precursor in broccoli. I should have broccoli here, but sorry. Um, There's a precursor in broccoli called glucoraphanin that's very stable. And it's found in quite high level in, for example, broccoli sprouts and seeds. There's an enzyme in the same plants, the same tissues. So all plants that have this stuff, this and related compounds have this enzyme. And when you as a human predator chomp on a plant, you break open cells, you release this compound from a vacuole, a a balloon that it's held in, in the plant cell, and you allow it to come in contact with this enzyme and you produce, or, or the, and it produces sulforaphane. And sulforaphane is where the pedal meets the, the metal or where the tire meets the road. This is biologically active. This is protective. And this, in, this is an indirect antioxidant that induces all these protective systems. Um, it doesn't stay around long and it's, 
it's not very suitable to use as a supplement. So it's sort of made on site as you chew that raw cruciferous vegetable. Um, and it's, it's, there's very, very, there are over 100, 150, 130, I think, different natural isothiocyanates in all the cruciferous vegetables. So for example, horseradish, it's, 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 it's a lacrim, they're lacrimators. They're what make you cry and your eyes run. Mustard, mustard seed, um, radish, daikon, on and on. It turns out that the compound in broccoli isn't that much of a um, uh, lacrimator. It doesn't sting your eyes and make you cry as much, um, although it induces taste aversion in a lot of people. So the next slide, uh, or yeah, just is, tries to answer the question, well, what if you cook your broccoli um, or cruciferous vegetable? Well, if you cook it, then you have to count on your gut microflora to have this myrosinase activity. And it turns out that we all have this microflora. We have some myrosinase activity in our guts, some, and it varies by person all over the map, but everybody has at least a little bit. So a lot of people advocate giving us a, a, a a big wallop of a source of myrosinase and mustard seed happens to be a pretty good one. In addition to your, bro your broccoli, especially if you're cooking it, um, you know, it, is it necessary? No, but it's all in the dose because if you eat cooked broccoli, you're not going to get this. So if you add mustard seed, you'll get some more sulforaphane made. If you have raw broccoli, you're counting on the myrosinase in the broccoli. You probably don't need any added myrosinase. Um, so it's a toss up and, and various companies are, are promoting it. Various people and podcasts are promoting adding something like mustard seed. Mustard seed has gotten legs and there are a number of podcasters who've su who suggested it but it's relatively inexpensive and it's a taste that a lot of people are familiar with. So, uh, I mean, an alternative would be wasabi, but it's very expensive. An alternative would be daikon, but most people in the West can't stand raw daikon, so they wouldn't eat it. So there are all sorts of possibilities. Mustard seed seems to have percolated to the top on a lot of uh, people's radar. Why would people in general maybe some cultures are exempt, but in general, most people don't love the bitter taste, at least not right away, you know, of these kind of things like radish. Yeah. And it's, it's not like a preferred food, especially among children. Yeah. Um, it's an, it's an acquired taste. There are some fascinating theories that one of the, um, a, a student of one of the um, premier antioxidant <clears throat> gurus in the country, Bruce Ames, um, who's a fascinating guy um, and is at the Linus Pauling Institute. One of his postdocs or students a uh, hundred years ago, I don't know, at least 25 years ago, by the name of Margie Prophet, uh, wrote a book. She got a MacArthur Genius Award, wrote a book, and she postulated, among other things, that that bitter taste of uh, vegetables like, like broccoli um, was a necessary and a vital evolutionary feeding aversion uh, uh, thing, adaptation, that prevented pregnant women from eating potentially toxic uh, or teratogenic substances. So she had a whole book on this, which um, I have on my shelf someplace. Um, you know, I think a lot of people, uh, uh, Certainly, there are a lot of toxic compounds from plants that are bitter, but there also are a lot of beneficial compounds from plants that are that are bitter. Um, the taste, the bitter taste, or the the unique taste of broccoli and the cruciferous vegetables, is only in part, uh, and probably a fairly small part, due to its glucosinolates and isothiocyanates like glucoraphane and sulforaphane. Um, there are also other sulfur containing compounds that um, I mean, people have actually studied taste uh, tasters and non tasters of these compounds. Um, so there, there are, there, 
these compounds are often associated, the ones that I've just talked about, often associated with, um, with the bitter taste. But um, I, I believe there are a number of other compounds that are probably more responsible for that taste. Um, evolutionarily, will the people that hate bitter plants live longer and better lives? God, I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't think so, but I, I can't. I don't have any proof. Great. Thank you. Um, well, Lisa, who's watching live says, well, how does cauliflower compare to broccoli? Are all cruciferous vegetables created equal? And which, what are all the, do you know all the different cruciferous vegetables? Can you name them? There are about 500, I think. I guess um, you can't so, name them all. <laughs> so no, but I've, I've actually done, um, uh, I've done re review papers. Uh, sorry, I will screen share for you again. I've done review papers where we, we've itemized um, uh, the, as many of the edible cruciferous vegetables as possible. Um, I think someplace I have a little, I have a little picture in here that I can share. Yeah, and, and if you don't mind, Andrea, who's watching live said, does the mustard seed need to be ground into a powder before sprinkling it on the broccoli? And should that be done before or after cooking? If you're going to go that route, I would, yes, I would, grind it into a powder before adding it and add it absolutely after cooking because the whole point of it, and you know, it obviously alters the taste of what you're eating. The whole point of using it is you're saying, okay, I've compromised this, this converting enzyme in broccoli by cooking it. Because when you cook anything, you denature proteins in it, you inactivate them. That's how you preserve food, right? Um, you kill enzymes, so to speak. So yeah, you would add it after cooking if you really want to do that. But don't fear your body, whoever you are, wherever you are, your body has at least some of that myrosinase in its gut, unless you have just taken a massive course of uh, uh, intestinal antibiotics, and, and in which case you may actually be depleted from it. So these are probably the four most common Western, you know, supermarket cruciferous vegetables, broccoli, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, and broccoli. They all have, in fact, all of these on this page have very, very different pairs of glucosinolate and um, isothiocyanate. So broccoli actually is almost the only cruciferous vegetable that has sulforaphane in it. It turns out that there is a little bit in a, that comes from arugula, which I have over here. So this sort of phylogenetically in terms of relationships of plants, um, these four are actually the same genus and species. So these are very closely related, even though they look totally different. Cauliflower does not have any sulforaphane in it. Um, as I say, arugula has a little bit, um, but included in this family are things like daikon, um, radish, watercress, wasabi, turnip, collards, Chinese cabbage, rutabaga, canola, mustard greens, and on and on. The, the, there are, I think, 500 of them. Um, and so they're all good for you. To answer your question bluntly, yes, they're all good for you. They have some of these isothiocyanates that are indirect antioxidants. They may act a little better or a little worse than sulforaphane, who cares? You want a mix, you want a varied diet. Um, they have fiber um, and they have all the other nutritional components that you, that you want in a vegetable. So eat them. If you like cauliflower and don't like broccoli, go for it. Don't worry. You're going to, you're going to be just fine. Thank you so much. We have a question. Faith, what quantity of broccoli sprouts and or broccoli should one eat daily to get the health benefits? Um, that's another, thanks Faith for the question. It's another totally impossible question to answer truthfully and accurately, but we can approximate an answer. We, we have studied um, for, well, for many years, Paul Talley and I and others in the lab looked at the epidemiologic literature, looked at what we called aggressive or enthusiastic broccoli eaters. And we said, and, and we looked at the, the outcomes for things like breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, liver cancer, and on and on. 
and we were focused on cancer and carcinogenesis and preventing cancer when we started this work. But the bottom line with, for example, colon cancer was that people who ate based on epidemiology, not based on an intervention or a clinical trial, but people who ate two servings a day of broccoli or other cruciferous vegetables had a 50% reduction in the risk of colorectal cancer. And then other studies were done, which pretty much, which confirmed that. So colon cancer and rectal cancer risk was reduced by, by half. That's two servings a day or 60 servings a month. That's, that's the best kind of, that's actually a really, I think that's a really excellent answer to your question, but it, it may still not be the one you want. So I'm not saying you have to eat two servings a day, but I'm saying there's a substantial and significant reduction in the risk of just pick one type of cancer with two servings a day. It depends on the type of broccoli, how much it's been abused in the supermarket, um, how much pesticides might be on it. Uh, it depends on whether you eat it cooked or raw. So there's, a, you know, you probably got a sense for all the possible variables. Um, but yeah, two servings a day is totally a good amount to have. And one serving a day is great. And if you only get three servings a week or eat it every other day, that's super as long as you eat other veggies and fruit um, as well. I am H-O. What's that mean? How many do you eat every day? In my humble opinion. Oh, um, H-O. I am H-O. Okay. Yeah. Um, how many Because serv- I don't even know what a serving is. Because for me, a serving is a pound. And I eat at least a pound every day. That's a serving for me. So. Yeah. Well, I think the classic serving is something like 100 grams or a cup, which oh is my nothing. God, that's nothing. Which is that's nothing like a, for- that's a pittance. <laughs> I agree. For veggie eaters like us, yeah, yeah, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not vegan, and I'm not strictly vegetarian, but, but absolutely plant forward. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, so, do we have a book to look forward to from you? Huh. I hope so. I enjoy doing things like this much more than I enjoy writing books. Um, and so, yes, I would. I the plan is to do one. I have three chapters drafted out. I just have to find time to do it. I have been consulting and I've been writing up our research from my days at Hopkins. Um, and as I say, I really enjoy this sort of communication as much as anything. Um, I sort of have trouble finding myself hidden away for a year in a closet, trying to write and focus and concentrate, but um, uh, we'll see. And it will be about health span. And the title, the working title is health span, squaring off the quality of life curve. Okay. Yep. okay. Well, I may as well ask. I was going to, I was going to say goodbye to you and say, if you like doing this, maybe you'll come back. Cause we, we didn't, I don't think we even talked a lot about Moringa today, which is something that also you talk a lot about, but um, we have a viewer that says plant forward. Why is he not fully plant-based and how can we convince you to do so? <laughs> Let, let's make that the subject of another, of another session. I would love to. And I, and I should tell you, my, my wife got was, we're trying to teach our young granddaughter, um, uh, she's starting to write, starting to read. And so it was, what was on there? She, they had Moringa, uh, they had written out Moringa with, with paste on letters, uh, with magnetic letters. So I, I am very fond of Moringa and you, you're you welcome to call it a superfood. Um, the problem with it in this country is that the fresh Moringa is, it's essentially impossible to find because it's a tropical vegetable. So uh, but there's plenty, I, I'm consulting for a company called Cooley Cooley that has um, dried Moringa leaf powder. And it's a spectacular vegetable, not for everybody's taste, um, but it is it is loaded with all the good things that we've talked about, including phytochemicals. So well, I'd love, to, love to come back and talk about that, but yeah. Great. Well, if you want, we could stop your screen share and then we can say goodbye to you so we can see you a little bit bigger. <laughs> Sorry. Does your does your I, granddaughter eat broccoli sprouts? Um, she has tried them. So I I sprout at home. I make broccoli broccoli and many other sprouts, and she has tried them. But I haven't gotten my son and daughter in law to set up a sprouting factory at their house um, yet. Yeah. Okay. Well, there's always hope. Well, thank Coming. you so much, Dr. Fahey. That I find a lot of this fascinating, and uh, you know, I'm a big broccoli fan from back in the day. So. <laughs> I, Another Thank you fellow. so much. 
uh, thanks for having me and thanks for wearing wearing the way you uh yeah. well, wearing I, your heart I, on your sleeve. <laughs> I try to I whatever I find out a little bit about my guests and I try to wear something that will do that. So thank you so much. This was fascinating. And thanks to all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back tomorrow when we have two shows. At 11 a.m., we have Eileen Canner, who is going to be making a ceviche. It's vegan, though. And at 2 p.m., Carrie Otis is going to be talking about stand-up comedy. Did you know I do stand-up comedy on the side, Dr. Fahey? Um, I had heard that from yeah. a mutual friend, but I but I haven't I haven't seen any of it. Yeah, it's on my channel. You should try it. I bet you'd be funny with all this scientific stuff. I'd love to. Um, I, it's just a question of finding enough time. Um, but... Um, but, you know, I retired. I'm supposed to be. I know you should. This is when you're supposed to have the time. That's well, right. as right. long as you have time to eat broccoli, that's the most important. Yeah. Okay. Thanks so Th much. And take care. Bye-bye.